kära tränare, dear dear friends, and special welcome to Professor Harrison Smith. We're really looking forward to hearing your speech. And you have not come to Sweden because of the Swedish weather. That's for sure. But you are most welcome. Please. Skal vi snakke litt om månen? Jeg var i Norge for flere år siden, men jeg har glemt mye, mye norsk, and I never learned svensk. <laughs> what we're going to do tonight is take a very rapid trip to the moon, uh, first via the uh, PowerPoint presentation that uh, will begin here, and then uh, maybe a little more dynamically with a, uh, a DVD that was prepared some, uh, a few years ago that summarizes what, uh, in, in uh, film, what I uh, will try to tell you first. But first of all, it's probably wise to uh, remember the uh, Apollo program and the context in which it was, uh, was conducted. Uh, this now uh, took place 40, now 40 more uh, years ago. And the landing on the moon was first proposed by President Kennedy uh, in 1961, but the process of landing on the moon began much uh, somewhat earlier than that. Of course, the first stimulus uh, that really energized the United States space program was the uh, Sputnik, the launch of the first artificial satellite of the Earth by the then Soviet Union. And, and by 1958, uh, President Eisenhower and the Congress had agreed to uh, uh, create uh, NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. It was created out of a uh, organization known as the uh, National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, uh, the NACA, and that was very fortunate because the uh, principals in the NACA had already managed very complex aircraft programs particularly the X-15, it was, in, uh, was being run at that time, by, by uh, Robert Gilruth and uh, Chris Kraft and George Lowe, these names may be familiar to some of you. Uh, they, uh, they really were the people that uh, uh, turned the, uh, uh, the idea of going to the moon into reality. <clears throat> it was though, and we must remember that, to counter the uh, Soviet advances in human spaceflight, uh, that uh, was a directly uh, part of the major contribution of the Cold War between communism and democracy of that time. Uh, and was a very important factor in it. It, uh, it really did, uh, some Russian emigres as well as others <laughs> believe that it uh, was the catalyst that uh, uh, created uh, the environment in which the Cold War ultimately ended. Now, Neil Armstrong successfully landed on the moon in July of 1969, and this, uh, from, from a formal perspective, ended the moon race. Uh, there were five additional Apollo missions uh, that landed on the moon between 1969 and 1972. Indeed, between December of 1968, when Apollo, the, uh, uh, November of 1968, when the Apollo 7 uh, launch occurred, that was an Earth orbit test of the command and service module, uh, and uh, November of 1969, there was a, a launch of effectively a moon mission every two months uh, by a rocket we will talk about uh, more in a moment, a, a 
uh, immensely successful rocket. The uh, last three Apollo missions uh, each explored the moon for a total of, of three days, uh, uh, 20, 21 hours uh, each. And each of those missions had a lunar rover that you'll see shortly uh, that enabled a much more, broad, a much more broadly uh, effective exploration than, uh, than the previous missions, even though all the missions returned excellent suites of lunar samples for us scientists to work on. And that work continues today. There were some 385 kilograms of lunar rocks brought back to Earth. And you would be amazed at the amount of work that continues. Uh, there, there's a Lunar and Planetary Science Conference going to happen next month. It's happened every year since 1970. And, uh, and it continues to uh, uh, amaze me uh, how, how much work is being done by uh, new generations of, uh, of scientists. Uh, how they're getting paid, I have no idea. But, uh, <laughs> we'll leave that some other way. And what all of this is giving us and continues to give us in an increasingly sophisticated way is a new understanding of the Earth's history. This is the science return that we got for what was originally a purely geopolitical uh, mission. Uh, but fortunately, the, uh, the people such as I mentioned uh, earlier who were managing the program realized that if they had the capability to go to the moon, they had the capability to explore the moon. And that uh, made all the difference in the world within the context of the Apollo uh, purpose, original purpose. That uh, history, of course, is a history that's obscure to uh, my geological colleagues here on Earth because the Earth is a very active planet. Now, Sweden's in an area, a shield area, we call it, that's not quite as active as, as other parts of, uh, of the planet. But if you look at what's happening around the Pacific Rim, uh, you can see that uh, the Earth is still very, very active and changing itself, and it has obscured this early history. Uh, after about 3.5 billion years ago, uh, uh, things changed a great deal. Before that, and during the period in which life was evolving uh, on the planet, uh, we had no insights about the environment of the inner solar system during which that was occurring until we went to the moon. And what we discovered was an extraordinarily violent period uh, in the history of the solar system, but still life found a way. Now, life found a way to uh, learn how to survive, too, uh, in the Apollo days. Uh, the, uh, we had thousands of hours of training in simulators, of course, and aircraft and helicopters and the like, and all the Apollo uh, uh, people, including myself, uh, uh, had to be jet pilots and helicopter pilots and, uh, as well as uh, spacecraft pilots. But uh, there was still uncertainty in those early days of whether the mission coming back to Earth would actually land exactly where it had planned to land. And the possibility was thought to exist that we might end up in the jungle, as you see here, or in the <laughs> desert, or out in the water somewhere for several days. And we had survival training and all that. And here in, the, in, a, in Panama, they, uh, you see some uh, very young looking uh, uh, astronauts, although, uh, and coincidentally, uh, uh, the uh, gentleman on, uh, on your left, Ed Mitchell, uh, just passed away on the 4th of February. Yeah, uh, and, and on the eve of his landing on the moon uh, with Al Shepard. Uh, Ron Evans passed away some many years earlier. On the right, uh, he was our command module pilot on Apollo 17. Uh, yours truly somehow still gets invited to make talks. Such as <laughs> And uh, if I ever need another career, it looks like I could handle myself. <laughs> now, the uh, first mission to the moon uh, was crewed by uh, uh, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Mike Collins, and they are in this picture. Mike on the left, uh, Buzz on the right, Neil just in front of him, and a couple other uh, young, much uh, younger astronauts uh, in between. The, uh, 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 now, as far as Neil's mission on the moon, uh, there was, uh, for some reason, a decision, Neil made a decision, uh, that uh, he would handle the camera for most of the time on the moon. And as a result, you see many pictures of a uh, second generation Swede, namely uh, Buzz Aldrin, uh, uh, but uh, only one, as far as we know, of Neil Armstrong, and this is it. Mm -hmm. and, and Neil, at this point, is 
uh, filling a box, a vacuum seal uh, box, with the samples that he collected. And by the way, he collected one of the finest suites of samples of any of the missions in a very short period of time, about 20 minutes. But he uh, told me later, as we worked together on other projects, that the box looked awfully empty when he had put all those rocks in there, and so he filled it with dirt, <laughs> with lunar soil. And that sample, 10080, we all know what its number is, uh, has turned out to be one of the most valuable samples for those of us who think that there is a potential for a private uh, venture on the moon producing uh, energy from its soil. And uh, they, the, that sample that Neil collected is our, our uh, primary uh, case in point. The, uh, Two missions uh, that uh, are bookends, if you will, of the Apollo landings on the moon. Apollo 11 and Apollo 17 landed about 600 uh, uh, kilometers apart in two different basins uh, and came away with very different pictures of uh, what uh, the moon was like, uh, which has been integrated, of course, into the other missions. This, uh, this particular picture I took on the way back to Earth and uh, we had not quite left the vicinity of the moon to the point of where we couldn't see some of the far side. And the right-hand portion, uh, say third of that picture, is the far side of the moon. Uh, and a, a famous uh, crater, one of the first photographed by anyone, in, in, this, in the case of uh, the uh, Soviet spacecraft, uh, uh, Silkovsky is down in the lower right, just, uh, just coming into sunshine. Now, what made all of this possible was the Saturn V rocket. The Saturn V uh, was initiated about a year and a half before President Kennedy made his, uh, his uh, announcement that we would go to the moon. Uh, it uh, was, came as a result of a, uh, of a great deal of technological work done uh, at the uh, uh, Army's Redstone Arsenal in uh, Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, by Werner von Braun and others uh, at the, uh, who had uh, come out of World War II. But Eisenhower told the then administrator of NASA, T. Keith Glennon, uh, who had previously been president of Case University, a very famous uh, in, uh, technical university in, in uh, uh, America, uh, that he should begin the development of what was then called a super booster. And that basically was the Saturn V. And so that all started, fortunately, in terms of Kennedy's challenge to get to the moon before the end of the decade of the 60s. Uh, fortunately, we had a head start with the rocket that made it possible. Now, the building there, this is actually the Apollo 17 Saturn V uh, rolling out to the launch pad uh, out of the uh, vehicle assembly building. That's the big building there behind it. And to give you some perspective of just uh, how big that uh, is a very large fire truck right there. So at the time, it was the largest enclosed space uh, in the world. Now, the uh, spacecraft that we used uh, were situated in the uh, uh, pointy end of that rocket, uh, the lunar module in what was called a SLA, and I can't remember what that acronym stands for, I'm sorry. Uh, the, somebody even in this room may remember what it is. And also the command and service module in which we were residing during this period uh, was up in the very top of it. The, the pointed uh, rocket right on top of the uh, Saturn V is the launch escape tower. It was for, for a period of time, about a minute during the launch, uh, the, uh, we could be pulled away from the, uh, an exploding rocket with that uh, launch escape tower. Uh, after that, we would fly away. Uh, uh, from it. But uh, fortunately, none of that ever happened, even though we were prepared for it. The, uh, now, if you look carefully on the left-hand side of the rocket, you see a great deal of debris seemingly coming off. Uh, those white flecks here, they're actually very large pieces of ice, of frost. Uh, we had to uh, wait on the pad for about two hours and 40 minutes from after the uh, planned launch, uh, launch time in order for a computer problem to be worked out in the launch computer. And uh, it turned out not to be serious, but not, and certainly something that could be fixed. But in, during that time, out of the uh, humid Florida air, the uh, uh, frost 
accumulated on the cold sides of the rocket. Uh, remember now, there are fuel tanks in there of liquid hydrogen and liquid uh, oxygen that make the rocket itself quite cold. However, right at this point, there's very heavy vibration, uh, low frequency vibration <laughs> that uh, is enough to uh, cause essentially all of that ice to come off the rocket. So we didn't have to carry that penalty into space. We carried a little bit of it on the, uh, this rocket up here, the S S4B that injected us into lunar orbit, and when we, after that injection, and it shut down, a little bit of ice started to float along with us towards the moon. What happened to that ice, I have no idea. <laughs> but it, uh, it was really quite spectacular at the time. Now, I, uh, you've seen this picture before. I only show it again not to emphasize how much some of us have aged, but, uh, uh, but to uh, illustrate some of the uh, uh, of another spacecraft. We often forget that, that the spacesuit itself was a spacecraft. It had, it had oxygen, water for cooling. Uh, we had water-cooled underwear, by the way. That's how we stayed uh, cool while working in that suit. Uh, it, uh, it had a, a power supply, communications, everything you can expect a spacecraft to have, except it was shaped more or less like a human being. Uh, and uh, it had even mobility because we were inside of it, right? And we're able to move it around. Uh, now, if you ever uh, experience getting into one of these suits, one clue is that anything that's, that's blue here, anodized blue, uh, represents an input to the suit. Communications, uh, cooling water for that underwear, uh, fresh oxygen, uh, and, uh, and, the, and the light. Uh, and the, uh, there's even a, one of them, uh, this one right down here, is an input for emergency oxygen. We had a high pressure oxygen bottle, you'll see later on our backpack, that uh, would supply emergency oxygen. Now the red is what is uh, our exit ports uh, that would go back in, uh, in one case, back into the, uh, the portable life support system to be cleaned of carbon dioxide, and in the other case uh, would be purged directly into the atmosphere in order to provide circulation if you ever needed that emergency oxygen supply. The, uh, oh, and by the way, uh, later on you'll see a Hasselblad camera on the front of the suit, and that uh, was attached to that, uh, I guess this isn't going to, there we go, it was attached to that bracket right there. Uh, the, uh, now, we're on our way to the moon, and one of the first things we had to do was go into Earth orbit to check everything out. 90-minute orbits uh, around the Earth, it's slightly under uh, 18,000 miles an hour. Uh, and uh, here over the South Atlantic, I uh, had a chance to take a few uh, uh, cloud pictures, but I want you particularly to notice that band of blue in the above the horizon. Uh, that, of course, is our atmosphere, and just keep that in mind for a later picture. Uh, I had uh, planned to take a great number of uh, pictures and observations of weather patterns in the southern hemisphere on the way to the moon when, uh, whenever our other duties uh, permitted, and uh, I did do that a, a great deal. This is the first uh, main documentation picture I took of those uh, early patterns that I saw. Uh, and now uh, it turns out this is the most requested picture from the NASA archives, uh, used in advertising uh, everywhere, the, uh, and for other purposes as well. That is a hurricane typhoon going ashore on the subcontinent of India, uh, the intertropical convergence zone that uh, uh, Christer has seen again and again and again from uh, 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 Earth orbit. Uh, is there, and uh, here though, not quite a full Earth, the Mediterranean there and the South Pole right down there. Uh, fortunately for weather observations, the uh, absence of main continental masses in the southern hemisphere give very symmetrical patterns around the source of the weather, and that is of course the Antarctic continent. Now this is a picture I want you to remember that band of blue because it doesn't exist around the moon. There is no sensible atmosphere around the moon. This picture uh, uh, was taken uh, uh, just after we went into lunar orbit. It's a lunar uh, sunset. Uh, we were, it actually, the spacecraft was 
for us, it was a lunar sunrise. We were in what the astronomers call a retrograde orbit, and I'll let you ask your grandchildren or children just what that's all about. Uh, but uh, this is not a bad representation of what things look like. Uh, slightly tan in the sunlight in this particular case, and very dark uh, in the shadows. The Apollo 17 mission was targeted to the uh, Taurus Littrow Valley, uh, a 50 kilometer long valley uh, that uh, uh, you see on the right here. Uh, those mountains on either side rise to 2100, uh, 1500 to 2100 meters. And so the valley itself is deeper than the Grand Canyon of the Colorado in the United States. It's a remarkable place. And we were able to land right there uh, due to the remarkable navigation capabilities that were developed for the Apollo program and are used uh, today in many different uh, respects. Uh, the, uh, the other spacecraft with our colleague Ron Evans uh, in it was there taking navigation sightings of small craters near the landing site whose position we had determined through photogrammetric techniques relative to the center of mass of the moon. Uh, now that's very important to be flying your, doing your orbital mechanics relative to the center of mass, of course, and, uh, and that and really enabled the, uh, the actual landing in this valley. Uh, otherwise, we would not have been had nearly the precision necessary to do so. The uh, camp that we set up on the moon, as you see here, the Challenger uh, lunar module, uh, uh, landed uh, uh, on uh, December 11th, 1972. Uh, and uh, this is a picture I took as one of many uh, panoramas of the area uh, in the first excursion, or our extravehicular activity period, so that we would document as best we could uh, the landing site before it got, uh, it would became uh, disturbed by our activities. The, uh, uh, on, the, on the right here you see uh, the ladder that we use to get in and out of the uh, spacecraft. Now this is everything you need in order to work on the moon. Uh, that, uh, uh, you need a the camp that I've already uh, mentioned. Uh, a lunar rover certainly helps. It enabled us to drive 35 kilometers around the surface of this valley. And at one point, we were about seven kilometers away from the lunar uh, module itself. And of course, the other spacecraft with a human being inside of it, uh, uh, you see there, yours truly uh, having his portrait taken for whatever posterity exists. The, uh, the only problem we had with the lunar rover was uh, uh, getting fenders broken off by commanders of the mission. This seemed to happen on all three of the missions that uh, had the rover. Uh, for a variety of reasons, but uh, with the great help of our friends down on uh, uh, in Mission Control Center, they came up with a repair that took about five minutes. Uh, we put these uh, these unneeded photo maps together with gray duct tape, as you might expect, uh, <laughs> and clamped them on the uh, fender with an unneeded photo map, uh, unneeded clamps uh, for uh, lights in the uh, in the uh, lunar module. Uh, it worked very well, and the reason it was important is that uh, driving you, you in one-sixth gravity, you get, which is the gravity of the moon, one-sixth Earth gravity, you get just enough uh, uh, rise of the dirt off the wheel that you get a forward rooster tail. You get uh, dust coming uh, ahead of you, and, uh, and some of that filters down on the rover itself and on the crew, and, and it's just a nuisance. It really is a nuisance. So, and it takes a lot of time to dust surfaces that need to be uh, thermally controlled and like. So repairing that fender was quite important. Fortunately, it didn't take very long. Not for us, it took all night for the people in Mission Control to come up with a way, the best way to do it. Uh, there's now the, the spacesuit uh, in use, the backpack you can see. There's a, a, a bag for samples uh, on my uh, uh, sh uh, side of the backpack here. This is that emergency bottle that I mentioned up there. Uh, the uh, uh, Hasselblad camera, of course, is right there but mounted on it. People always, often ask, how in the world do you keep pointing that so well? Because all the pictures are pretty well pointed. And you just learn. We practiced and practiced and practiced uh, taking those pictures until it was very natural to point your chest in the right direction. <laughs> the, uh, the, I'm uh, taking a sample uh, we call our rake sample. Uh, that uh, uh, is actually a sieve that uh, uh, 
collected particles that were uh, greater than about a centimeter or two in diameter, uh, and we expected to uh, find exotic fragments in that sample more so than just uh, in the ordinary material. That worked pretty well, except I won't go into it right here. It didn't work at all here, except we had lots of good samples of, of uh, basalts. The, uh, the only difficulty in using that suit, physical difficulty that I had, was uh, in the glove. It's a pressure glove. It's 3.7 pounds per square inch inside the glove. And, uh, and every time you squeeze it, it's like squeezing a tennis ball. And so for eight hours, you're working these muscles in your forearms. And uh, we just did not have enough insight in our training to uh, really prepare for that, uh, like, we, like the uh, uh, crews that have gone to the ISS, the International <coughs> Space Station, uh, have done. Uh, but it, it, we still we got the job done, and it worked out very well. The uh, uh, walking in the suit was, uh, I found, the best way to do that was to use a cross-country scheme, scheme technique. Uh, just a toe push and glide across above the surface rather than on it, and that works very efficiently and very well. And, and you probably could sustain eight or ten kilometers an hour for uh, quite a period of time doing that. Uh, this large boulder had rolled down the side of one of the mountains from about a kilometer and a half away. Uh, we had seen the boulder on pre-mission photography. It was big enough for the resolution of that early photography to pick up. And so we plan to go there. It's a very important geological station for us. I'm there for scale only. Uh, the, uh, uh, but if you uh, look carefully, that's the light spot over there uh, is the lunar module sitting in an area that's been winnowed away a little bit by the descent engine, so it becomes lighter than the rest of the surface. And here you can see my footprints going down into the trench behind the boulder that led up to its source. Uh, and those footprints uh, uh, actually will stay there for about uh, a million years, maybe two million years in recognizable form. <laughs> the only erosion on the moon, uh, the impact of very small meteors, we call them micrometeorites, uh, and uh, the only uh, continuous erosion is that, and uh, that will gradually garden the surface so they'll disappear. This is a fairly steep slope. It's actually about 20 degree slope that the rover is parked on. <laughs> Uh, one of the uh, uh, many geological discoveries of our mission was the uh, discovery of, of volcanic ash, this orange soil that you see in this picture, uh, really uh, turned out to be uh, very important and still is, many people working on it, including your, uh, myself. Uh, but uh, one of the most recent discoveries, because of the advance of technology over 40 years, is that within little tiny, these little tiny beads of glass that constitute this uh, ash, uh, there are small crystals of olivine, and within those uh, olivine, there, is a, there are, are, are little uh, concentrations of lunar water. So we, uh, this material was the first uh, definitive indication that the moon has water inside it, and that has, has some significant implications to understanding the origin of the moon. Uh, Standing around in your underwear on the moon is not something that uh, uh, most people would think you'd do, but it was the most comfortable uh, that we had, particularly as the spacecraft got warm, as the sun rose slowly uh, in the east. And that uh, uh, picture really doesn't prove that I was on the moon, but uh, it, to me it does. <laughs> the, uh, outside the spacecraft, I uh, had a chance uh, after the second excursion to take this uh, picture through my window, and it shows how we had begun to stir up an otherwise pristine surface with our activities. The, uh, uh, the surface itself has very high bearing strength initially, but as you work on it, it gets stirred up. And, uh, and the future settlers of the moon uh, will have to figure out a way to stabilize those surfaces, and I think there are a number of, of options there to do that uh, if you're gonna stay any length of time. The uh, metallic uh, cones there on the right are small restartable rockets. Uh, they had about 50 pounds of thrust uh, each. They were used, we had 16 of them spaced around the spacecraft in order to control its attitude as we flew through space. The, uh, uh, that 50 pounds thrust is contract, contrasted with the 1.5 million pounds of thrust of the engines in the first stage of the Saturn V. 
So there's a tremendous spectrum of, of propulsion technology that was required uh, in order to make this, uh, these missions possible. Well, we left the moon after about 75 hours uh, on the surface, 22, almost 22 hours outside the spacecraft. Uh, and this uh, uh, picture uh, is not a very good one. It was taken off the television monitor where the uh, uh, television had been parked about 300 meters away to just for this purpose to watch the, uh, the liftoff. Uh, that, uh, 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 the commander asked me to, uh, to go out, or suggested that I go out and get a really good picture of liftoff, but I declined. <laughs> Fortunately, and it means I could be here with you tonight. Now, we have a spacecraft in orbit around the uh, moon right now called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, taking extremely high resolution pictures of the entire moon. It's, it's a work in progress, but a great deal is being learned uh, as a result of having these higher resolution pictures, even about a place that you visited. I'm just in the process of publishing a paper on how this uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter imagery has helped understand the uh, geology of the Valley of Taurus Littrell. Here you go, you see that uh, our tracks, my tracks going out, uh, uh, this, uh, this set right here, we wandering around looking for a good place to deploy the uh, science experiment package that was deployed right there. The lunar rover is parked over there, that's where that picture was taken from. And you can and to get an idea of the fine resolution of these pictures is see these rover tracks. Those wheels, you've already seen them, they're only about this wide. So uh, they've stirred up uh, dark material from underneath that light surface that was caused by the descent engine effluence. The ascent engine of the Challenger, uh, the ascent uh, stage of the Challenger uh, returned to uh, uh, rendezvous with uh, Ron Evans and the uh, Spacecraft America. Ron was, uh, had been conducting a variety of experiments uh, in the spacecraft while we were gone. This is maybe the first uh, space selfie for all I know. Uh, and uh, he uh, is demonstrating here a, a problem that uh, of some uh, small consequence that we had, and that is that our water was produced by fuel cells. That is oxygen, hydrogen fuel cells that combined uh, over a catalyst to produce electricity and water. And, uh, and, but some hydrogen always ended up in the water, and here Ron has succeeded in getting that hydrogen to coalesce into a bubble in a bag of salmon salad. Yeah. And uh, some of you uh, are aware uh, the salmon salad was fine, there was nothing wrong with it, it wasn't spoiled or anything like that, but it uh, was not the most delectable food that we had in the spacecraft. Uh, in fact, the best food we had was irradiated food, food that had been irradiated with gamma rays to kill off the bacteria. The Army, uh, the U.S. Army had developed that, uh, uh, what they call wet packs uh, for uh, long-term storage of food, and they were quite good. They had fruitcake, believe it or not, it was excellent, high-protein fruitcake. Uh, we had the hot dogs, uh, sausages, and uh, peanut butter, and, uh, and uh, the... Uh, uh, I think that's it. I think I gave, I gave, I gave you all of them. Yeah. And, and those disappeared very fast. Anything that had some taste to it disappeared very quickly. Your, 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 uh, your appetite is reduced, in, uh, at least initially in space, ours were, and, uh, and your, uh, you, you crave spice. And I think that's mainly because NASA took all the spice out of the food. <laughs> they didn't want any uh, untoward effects of having that spice in you, and that's a, another story. Well, uh, we entered the atmosphere at uh, about 25,000 miles an hour, just about the speed that we left. Uh, uh, these uh, parachutes, big chutes, were deployed at 10,000 feet. We had splashed down near uh, uh, almost exactly where we had planned to splash down and to the minute of the time that was scheduled for splash down. And the Ticonderoga was sitting out there, uh, uh, an ASW carrier uh, waiting for our arrival actually waiting for us about five nautical miles away just to make sure we didn't have a carrier landing. Because uh, our navigation was better than the Navy's. Uh, there's, a, there's a story that uh, about the, in the early missions, one of the f mission controllers, without talking to his boss, requ had requested the Navy, and the Navy complied that they park a nuclear submarine under the carrier. So 
because the nuclear submarines had very precise navigation. <laughs> and, uh, he got in some trouble for that when NASA got the bill for the, the <laughs> nuclear submarine on deployment. <clears throat> a good friend of mine, he was quite a character. Uh, anyway, we, uh, we ended up uh, uh, being uh, picked up by the Navy SEALs uh, and, uh, and moving over to the carrier. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, just uh, a quick uh, revisit to the moon here with uh, uh, the astronaut, the uh, mountains of the moon behind, the flag of the United States and the Earth uh, above it. Uh, the, uh, uh, but uh, I, I show this other picture of an Earth rise from behind the moon is just to remind us that as uh, another generation goes off to uh, Mars, this may be one of the views that they, uh, one of the parting views that they have of the Earth as it rises over the moon. Uh, and I feel very strongly, and I know others do as well, that uh, the fastest way for us to uh, move on into space to get to Mars is by way of the moon and, and using its resources as well as learning again how to work in deep space. So it's probably about time we took another walk on the moon. And with that, we'll move uh, from this presentation over to the DVD, if in fact it's queued up. This DVD was produced for uh, one of our anniversaries. Uh, it uh, uh, is a very quick uh, move through the Apollo uh, mission, uh, beginning with uh, some uh, uh, recorded quotes from the very commanders of the various missions as they uh, uh, moved uh, uh, their, their flights uh, through space. The uh, Apollo 10 mission, which you saw the logo of there, was a precursor to Apollo 11, uh, landing uh, there, uh, uh, not landing on the moon but going very close and exercising all of the procedures necessary to land on the moon. Uh, and of course, the last uh, of the, the three missions, Apollo 15, now 16, and then 17, uh, were the culmination of the actual exploration of the surface of the moon. The, uh, this film was put together by uh, friends of mine in Canada, the uh, Apogee Books people, uh, Bob Gunn. Now, we'll see this again a little bit later in the film, but this is some uh, team sampling of the volcanic ash that I mentioned earlier in the presentation. We did uh, uh, not only the training that we discussed earlier, but our geological training. Once a month, we would spend four or five days on simulated uh, lunar field exercises, but on real geological problems. Uh, that made a, a big difference in the training, I think, of the pilot astronauts in particular, as they begin to uh, assimilate uh, just how geologists uh, work on complex problems. Uh, you've already uh, been uh, indoctrinated on the jungle training. And uh, uh, our uh, efforts to uh, guide a raft down the Changos River in Panama. Uh, the crew of Apollo 17, Ron Evans, uh, myself, and Gene Cernan. Uh, Ron, uh, suiting up, very enthusiastic young man. And here, uh, Al Shepard is trying to talk to me through my helmet. I don't think that ever worked. I don't remember that, what he said, but we seem to uh, enjoy ourselves. Headed for the... Uh, the uh, a van that would take us out the launch pad. I seem to have forgotten where the elevator was. Uh, I finally realized that there and now, in the van, I decided maybe this wasn't a good idea. <laughs> Charlie Buckley was not about to let me out of that van. Uh, the white, what's called the white room, it's where the people strap you into the uh, spacecraft, and believe me, they strap you in. They get in there with you and put their foot on your chest and make sure all those uh, straps are as tight as possible. And, and you want it to be, not only because of this heavy vibration during this stage of the flight, but also uh, because at uh, staging, that is when the first stage uh, shuts down and the second stage ignites, you go through a sequence of plus four and a half Gs to minus one and a half Gs to plus one and a half Gs, all in less than a second. Just a second and all of that happens. 
Uh, now we're all weightless. Uh, uh, this period of time when I probably was spending most of my time looking out the window, uh, watching the earth recede from us. Uh, that uh, uh, sequence that you'll see here in a moment of uh, from the full earth uh, to about a two-thirds earth by the time we uh, uh, reached the moon, uh, as, since we were in a lunar reference trajectory, what they call lunar, we were watching the earth turn every 24 hours. So that uh, gave us an opportunity to see this kind of a sequence of pictures. There's Australia, the beacon of the South Pacific. Almost never any clouds on Australia. And I'm sure they, except when they're big floods, and they, uh, they tend to regret that. Mm -hmm. There's the Valley of Tar Celestial once again. The uh, Command and Service Module moves me across. Now we're undock, undocking from uh, uh, the other spacecraft and headed towards the moon. Uh, now what I want you to do is watch the uh, bright spot right here. That's what's called zero phase point. Now there's the shadow of the Challenger just coming out of that big crater called Camelot. And as you get closer, you'll start to, as we get closer, you'll start to see the streaming of the dust that I mentioned earlier. Always some dust, there you, it's streaming, and then we had uh, our touchdown. This is a, a, a set of pictures, a, a panorama of, uh, of some of the pictures we took out of the uh, uh, lunar module windows. Now, uh, the deployment of the uh, science packages were largely up to me uh, while uh, uh, the commander drilled a, a, a series of holes for heat probe, uh, heat, heat flow measurements, and also to get a, a deep core, about a three meter core. He asked me to come over and help him, and uh, I'm, I was not asked to come back. Uh, maintaining your balance was always a bit of a problem. Here I had, uh, uh, had uh, was carrying a sample bag, uh, doing some uh, solo sampling, which normally we did not do. We worked as a team. And I dropped the bag, and some of the samples had come out. And getting up is not that much of a problem. You just lean back and let the suit sort of spring you up. Remember, it's a press suit, but hanging onto that stupid bag. <laughs> and then I start to get into trouble. <laughs> and about this time, I was informed that uh, by the uh, capsule communicator that the Houston Ballet Society would like a little more, <laughs> a, a, a little more uh, uh, professional demonstration. And so I decided to, uh, to give them a little bit more of a show. There we go. <laughs> but I still ended up with a camera in the dust. So. I'm sure Victor Hasselblad, if he was watching, was uh, very upset with me at that point. Uh, this is a uh, panorama actually taken off the television camera. So you'll see both of the astronauts in this. This is over where we found the volcanic ash, looking at a crater known, known as Shorty. Uh, and the uh, Rob Godwin, who put this whole thing together, was able to uh, uh, produce, produce some very nice panoramas. You saw this earlier, this, but it shows you how the team usually worked in sampling. Uh, the commander was holding the bag, and, uh, and I was uh, getting samples of various aspects of this volcanic ash deposit. Uh, that scoop turned out to be uh, one of the best sampling tools that we had. Not only could you dig a trench with it, but it enabled you to do some very, very precise sampling. Uh, we used a geological hammer fairly frequently, but uh, only when we were working on the large boulders. There uh, now is another view, uh, slightly different coloration of the uh, orange volcanic ash. Beneath that ash was, were layers of black volcanic ash. There had been a number of eruptions in the valley about three and a half billion years ago. Uh, and we talk about big numbers when we talk about uh, isotopic dating of the moon. This is what a, uh, a microscopic thin section looked like. Down in Houston, they were getting very excited about this. Uh, in fact, Jim Lovell, uh, the commander of Apollo 13, was in that picture. The uh, 
pilot astronauts, rather than uh, uh, taking my advice to learn how to cross-country ski, <laughs> like to hop across the surface, like you see uh, here. Uh, now remember, this is a 20 degree surface. surface. This is up near that big boulder. And I guess that's some defense <laughs> that it was uh, difficult to main your, maintain your balance. Now this is uh, another one of the uh, color television panoramas that uh, was put together. It shows different stages of the astronaut activities. As you can see, we, uh, the panorama itself was uh, taken over a period of time. Now, uh, I would, had done some sampling up in a small crater near that big boulder. Uh, I had my visor up so I could see better. That was a uh, sun protection visor. Uh, I didn't normally look into the sun, so I wasn't too worried about, about it. Uh, but you don't see many faces of people on the moon, so I'm glad I did that. Now I'm practicing some of my downhill skiing. I needed another pole, uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, I caught an edge there. Uh, and, uh, but ultimately, uh, uh, really had a, even though we were working and doing things we had to do, you could have a very good time on the moon. <laughs> One six gravity is, is very pleasant. It's like walking around on a giant trampoline. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been on trampolines recently, but uh, that's, that's about as close a uh, description of 1-6 gravity as I can give you. Now, this, he's padding in on the, the Challenger, the lunar module out there in the distance. We were about uh, four kilometers away at this point. Again, a panorama from the television uh, camera uh, that uh, has been printed. Uh, this is near a crater uh, we named Van Sur, uh, after a professor of mine at Harvard. Uh, and uh, it also is where I, I really can uh, give you a good demonstration of that toe-to-toe -to -toe movement, even through a boulder field. Uh, we had, I had a lot of confidence in my ability to control my emotions here. The uh, spacesuit obviously has gotten very dirty by this time, uh, uh, and the uh, 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 it didn't seem to affect the thermal control uh, significantly, uh, as, uh, but it uh, it did uh, uh, cause difficulties in the cabin because that dust was all brought in. We tried to brush it off, but that was just another way of getting your arms tired. <laughs> it didn't work very well. The uh, uh, liftoff, you've already seen a still. This is the uh, actual picture that the television camera transmitted. We had about a half an Earth G acceleration, uh, which was more than enough to get, uh, get us started in the orbit. Looking back down with this, uh, what uh, a, a film camera now, this picture, image was taken from film camera, and it just fades into the uh, picture you saw earlier uh, with the, uh, from the Lunar uh, Reconnaissance Orbiter. That cross that was there, if you noticed it, was a, an antenna layout that we had for a radar experiment. And you, in this picture, you, can sometimes, you could sometimes see the firing of those attitude control thrusters. Now this is uh, television, uh, cabin television, that uh, watching Ron Evans uh, move out to gather some uh, film canisters. We had a, a series of cameras and other uh, uh, radar experiments and others in a scientific equipment bay that he operated for all the days that we were down on the surface, as, as well as other times. Uh, and uh, I was monitoring his umbilical there. His oxygen supply was coming through that uh, umbilical. And I'm down, there's my head right in the uh, left of the, of the picture right there. Now a more dynamic view of, uh, of uh, Splashdown. Uh, the uh, uh, Ticonderoga was called into service uh, to pick us up uh, unexpectedly. It actually uh, had, six months before, was being decommissioned in dry dock. And they suddenly needed that uh, carrier and its capabilities in the Vietnam area. And uh, so it just happened to be in the right place at the right time to be our recovery ship. The, uh, uh, 
I believe that uh, was your surely coming up in the basket because I was the only one at the time that had dark hair. <laughs> That's how you tell. Now, I, uh, now you can see that we were all having to adapt, readapt to Earth gravity, wandering around on the uh, red carpet uh, from one side to the other. We, I don't think anybody actually got off the carpet, but it was, uh, it was a challenge. <laughs> Saying hello to our, our various uh, Welcome committee there, uh, the Captain Green, who was the captain of the Ticonderoga. Uh, Barry Goldwater actually was on the ship and came, came to see us and come back. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as I said before, this, uh, the exploration of the moon uh, has provided great scientific understanding. It was an important component of the Cold War. Uh, and uh, the uh, effort to get us back to the moon is uh, underway. I know Europe is spending a great deal of effort in thinking about that, uh, more so probably than we have uh, uh, in the United States recently, but still there is some momentum to, uh, for uh, the uh, co international community to come together for a return to the moon, and uh, I certainly think that's appropriate. These are the men who have been there. And you've already had a chance to gaze upon that. Thank you very much. Enjoying some moonshine, not not the drink, the, the, moon, the moonlight, I should say. Oh, 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 <laughs> the oh, of course. Drink. I understand. And then I realized that we should all be very, very grateful to you, as being the last man on the moon, being the last man in office, you didn't turn off the light. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hope not. I certainly didn't Thank want to. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a little present. Once again, thank you very, very much for the interesting you. Look at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Professor Schmidt, thank you for this wonderful uh, speech you had to us. Uh, since I'm a retired flight attendant, uh, he used to work for a major airline here in Europe. I want to ask you, how was the service uh, on the trip? <laughs> uh, uh, if we had a flight to the moon, which we didn't have, we wouldn't serve hot dogs and peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would think, uh, Professor Smith, that the questions that we have, I'm sure we have some questions about this trip to the moon. Happy to answer them. Yeah. Can we take that to the coffee after the dinner? Of course. Okay. Everybody, we know don't want to have a lot of food. No, food drop it up. And there it is. Patients, yes, sir. We need to get a little bit more busy to be. You already know where you're supposed to be. Welcome up, ladies and gentlemen. Thank <laughs> you.